Welcome back, everyone, to One on One, New York's longest running sports call in show. We are joined now by a very, very special guest. He is a Pulitzer Prize winner, a best selling author, and an associate editor for the Washington Post, Mr. David Moranis. First and foremost, David, how are you today? <laughs> Well, I'm doing great. Everything is good. I'm uh, in the middle of a book tour and so far so good. Thank wow. you. Wow. That's lovely. How long is your book tour going to be? Two months. Wow. <laughs> yes. That's quite a trek. So yeah. I assume your new book tour is for your new book, The Path Lit by Lightning, The Life Pretty much, of yes. <laughs> Jim Thorpe. Incredible. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about what inspired you to write about him in particular and how you came to focus on this story out of so many prolific sports stories throughout history? Well, sure, Samantha. Um, you know, I'm, I look for two things in the sports biographies that I've written. The first is just a naturally uh, dramatic story. Um, and the second is something that illuminates uh, American history or sociology in a larger way. So I consider this kind of the third in a trilogy of my sports biographies, the first being Vince Lombardi, who was not only a fabulous football coach, but also a way for me to write about leadership and the mythology of competition and success in American life and what it takes and what it costs. Um, the second was Roberto Clemente, the great ball player, not only a beautiful uh, right fielder and for the Pittsburgh Pirates, but also sort of that rare athlete who, um, you know, so many athletes are called heroes. Very few really are. Clemente was. Uh, you know, he died trying to deliver humanitarian aid to Nicaragua after an earthquake. So then comes Jim Thorpe. Uh, not only um, arguably, you know, the greatest athlete in world history <laughs> in some ways, um, you know, someone who at least did things that are unparalleled. No one else before or since has won two gold medals in the decathlon and pentathlon, been an all-American football player, uh, the first great NFL player, the president of what became the National Football League, and a Major League Baseball player. No one has done those three things. I mean, he was also, you know, could do anything. He was a great ballroom dancer. Uh, he played ice hockey. They say he even played marble. So that's part of it. But then I was looking for what's the larger part? Well, it's a way to use his life to write about the Native American experience. He was from the Sac and Fox Nation in Oklahoma and over the course of his life endured many things that emblem emblemize what happened to Native Americans. Yeah, hearing that, it's really easy to understand how Jim Thorpe sort of transcends sports and, you know, is a bigger character than just somebody on the field. Uh, as we know, Jim Thorpe's medals were confiscated for wrongful and even discriminatory reasons. You said in an interview that you went into your research with an open mind when deciding if, if this was a justifiable decision. Can you, you know, walk us through a bit of your thought process and research that ultimately led you to decide that this was an unjustified action? Well, uh, the decision was morally wrong and technically wrong. <laughs> the technical part is actually less important to me, but here it is. Um, the rules of the Olympic Committee said that any challenge to amateurism had to be filed within 30 days of the end of the Olympics. Uh, this challenge was filed six months later. So just technically it was wrong, but the moral ap uh, aspects of it are much greater. Uh, Jim Thorpe, yes, he did play uh, Bush League baseball for two seasons in the Eastern Carolina League. Uh, at a time when literally hundreds of college athletes were playing summer baseball in the same way. Most of them were using aliases. Uh, even Dwight Eisenhower played in the Kansas State League under the alias Wilson. There were so many uh, pseudonyms for players in the Eastern Carolina League that they called it the Pocahontas League because everyone was play named John Smith. Hmm. Jim Thorpe played under the name Jim Thorpe. He never tried to hide it. Um, and it was common knowledge uh, at the time. It was in the newspapers in North Carolina every day for two years. And then he goes on to win the Olympics in 1912. Another a story comes out in January of 1913. Jim Thorpe was a professional. Um, it was an interview with one of the managers, one of his managers in the Eastern Carolina League. And as soon as that happened, Everyone of, in power who knew exactly what Thorpe had done um, lied about it to save their own reputations. 
his coach at Carlisle was the famed Pop Warner, for whom youth football is named, a great coach, a less than reputable human being who um, knew exactly what Jim was doing, uh, had himself uh, recruited several of his Indian athletes to play in various uh, minor leagues. He knew what they were doing. When the scout was one of his best friends in Pennsylvania who brought these players down there. Um, he met with Thorpe at least twice during the period when Thorpe was playing baseball. There's no, it stretches uh, disbelief to think that, he, that they didn't talk about that because uh, Warner wanted Thorpe to come back to play football again. So of course he would have said, what the heck have you been doing, Jim? Uh, James E. Sullivan, for whom the amateur, uh, the greatest athlete of amateurism is named every year, the Sullivan Award. He was the head of the Amateur Athletic Union, the head of the American Olympic Committee, and on the board of advisors for the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, where Thorpe played. He too knew, and those two people more than anyone are responsible for Thorpe losing his medals. Absolutely. I mean, you've just named so many very, very prolific figures who were all involved in this in some way, somehow, which yes. to me, when I was reading about your book beforehand and reading about you, that all came somewhat as a surprise to me. I mean, as we know, there's corruption and everything, but the fact that it runs so deep is just constantly surprising. And I guess, was there anything else in your research that surprised you or shocked you that maybe you weren't expecting before you really dove down deep into the history of Jim Thorpe and what happened? Um, you know, there's so many things. I mean, I knew of Avery Brundage is also a villain in the book. He went on to be the head of the International Olympic Committee. I knew that he, you know, behaved horribly in 1936, uh, sort of spreading Nazi propaganda to help uh, persuade people that the U.S. should go compete in those Olympics in Berlin. I didn't realize until I started researching the book that he was a decathlete himself who competed against Jim Thorpe, you know, in 1912 in Stockholm. And not only that, you know, you. Brundage and the Olympics sort of have this concept of it's not whether you win a medal. Um, it's not even a, about national competition. It's about striving to do your personal best. Um, that was Brundage's sort of argument all along. Well, he dropped out of those, of, out of that decathlon when he wasn't doing well, you know, so he was even defying his own sort of motto. Um, you know, so many little things surprised me along the way when Thorpe was at the, uh, Carlisle Indian School, I was just delightfully surprised to see that one of his teachers there was Mary Ann Moore, the great American poet, you know, uh, this uh, tiny little woman who wrote wonderful poetry later, started her career teaching at the Carlisle Indian School, and Winthorpe was there and wrote about it um, in some later. So, you know, a million little things like that that I stumble across along the way of my research. You know, as a as a young kid in elementary school, we kind of get to see what went on with Jim Thorpe. It was sort of an overview. Uh, didn't get too much into specifics. We know that he was this great athlete, American yeah. Indian. Um, but how exactly today, considering how far gone he is, do we see the legacy of Jim Thorpe present? Like, how is he in our society today? Um, you know, he's, he lost his medals 110 years ago. So, you know, more than a century uh, gone from his greatest year, which was 1912, I remember, or a century ago. Um, but um, he, still, he still represents something huge. I mean, um, in, when he was um, at, the, at his peak, there was a sense, a widespread sense in uh, white America that the Indian race was dying. Uh, there was a great statue called uh, The End of the Trail, and it showed a Native American on horseback sort of slooped in the, in the horse. And, and it was meant that manifest destiny prevailed. Progress means that this race is gone. Well, it didn't die. You know, there were about 260,000 Native Americans at that point in 1915, and now they're, you know, it's, it's many, many, many more. Um, they figured out not only how to survive physically, but also culturally. When the attempts were made um, during Jim Thorpe's era, the motto of his school was kill the Indian, save the man. I mean, rid the 
rid the Native Americans of their language, their religion, their culture, cut their hair, dress them in cavalry uniforms, and try to acculturate and assimilate them entirely into white society. But Native Americans were able to survive and to maintain their, their heritage and their culture. And Jim Thorpe is a strong part of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you have just mentioned this whole great intersection of everything in this story of politics, of sports, of life, of assimilation and the entire history of America and this kind of cataclysmic little story right here. I guess switching gears slightly then, you've written sure. about everything on that note. You've written about politics. You've written about Mr. Obama. You've written about Hillary Clinton. You've written about everything in the sports world, like you mentioned with Clemente and Lombardi and Thorpe. I guess, what are some of the intersections that you've seen in those areas further on? Because everything is so interlinked. Yeah. What do you see in terms of those intersections or how one impacts the other? Well, in terms of the biographies I've written, which are both about political figures and sports figures. I'd say you'd see in almost everyone I've written about um, enormous willpower and perseverance to overcome obstacles to succeed. You know, whether it was Barack Obama dealing with becoming the first African-American president coming out of nowhere from Hawaii, um, you know, Bill Clinton from Southwest Arkansas, again, sort of out of nowhere, a state where no one had ever been president before or the sports figures, you know, Clemente having to overcome both race and language um, coming from Puerto Rico. Uh, Vince Lombardi struggling for 20 years as an assistant coach before he got his shot. And then Jim Thorpe, you know, the, coming out of uh, Indian territory to become a world-class figure. So I see that commonality in all of the figures that I've written about. So we are all Fordham students, me and Sam. Uh, so we only, if we feel that it's fair to mention the one and only Vince Lombardi. Of course. Uh, we see his name all over the campus. Yes, <laughs> one of the do. most famous alumni. It's uh, our entire uh, sports facility is named after him. So we, we, get a, we get a lot of him. But for you, what drove you towards the story? Well, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, I was, um, an adolescent uh, teenager during the glory years of Lombardi's Packers. Um, but that's not why I wrote the story. I mean, I'm not gonna write a, a biography of, of Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers or anyone else uh, affiliated with the Packers. You know, well, as I said, I'm looking for something larger and I thought Lombardi represented so much more than sports. It's not just that the trophy for the NFL is named for him. But he's an iconic figure in American life um, for, for his uh, leadership skills. You know, I mean, when I was writing the book, you know, I heard from, you know, people in every walk of life who said that Lombardi somehow motivated them or that they, they heard all of these uh, uh, motivational uh, sayings that were attributed to Vince Lombardi, whether they really were or not, right? Um, so, you know, it's for those reasons that I wanted to write about him and use his life to write also about American history during that period from when he was born in 1913 to when he died in 1970. Absolutely. Yeah. He is such a prolific figure. Like Will said, we see him all over our campus, obviously Super Bowl trophy, everything like that. We are. No, I have something to ask you, Samantha. Um, someone sent me a photograph mm -hmm. of the football field where they had a banner that said, when pride still mattered. Yes. which is the title of my book. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything is named after Vince Lombardi in that area. We have like, like well, that whole academic, I'm not academic, whoa, athletic uh -huh. facility. So we have a lot of Ram pride here. And as yeah, he's a well, Florida Ram, great. we love him. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I really enjoyed writing. I mean, I'm sure Fordham is much, much different from what it was um, in the 1930s when he was there in some ways. Um, but I really enjoyed writing about that period and what he learned from his professors, you know, sort of the, you know, the Jesuit philosophy that was inculcated in, in him was really important to the rest of his life. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I guess as our, as our final question, as we're running out of time here, I'll ask you one more. You have written about all these amazing people. Is there anyone you haven't written about yet that you'd like to? 
Well, there was someone who I wanted to write a book about, and it didn't quite happen, and that was Billie Jean King. Hmm. Um, I want to write a book about a, a woman athlete or, or figure, and I, I'm sure I will figure that out. Um, she wanted me to write it um, as an as told to book, you know, for her, and I don't do that. You know, I have to have the autonomy to write what I find. So, but, uh, you know, I, I admire her greatly. And maybe, you know, I think I'll find another figure like that to write about. Yes. That'd be incredible. I hope you do. I look forward to it one day. I would love to read a book either about her or about anyone else. So I would look forward to that. But okay. <laughs> with that, that is just about all of the time we have today. And thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your time and your stories and your wisdom. It has really been such an absolute pleasure. And for all of our listeners at home tuning into One on One, The Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe is now available. It's out everywhere. Buy it on Amazon, buy it at your bookstore. Um, be sure to check it out. We will be right back with more right here on One on One. And thank you so much again, David Moranis, for joining thank us Thank you, today. Will and Samantha. Go Rams. Take Go care. Rams. <laughs>